through he, Jesus, have quickened who were dead in the trespasses of sin. So he's speaking past tense to the believers at Ephesus. And he's saying, uh, first, salvation is from sin, which characterizes the life before we were in Christ. Amen? Mm -hmm. When we, as we go through this, you'll see in the first three verses, there's no clearer statement in scripture on the sinfulness of mankind apart from Jesus Christ. When he says, and you, he has quickened. Quickened mean he made us alive. Amen? And so, and, and when we was in chapter 1, remember in verse 19 when Paul began to pray for the believers at Ephesus and that prayer even reaches us, he, he prayed for the readers to recognize what God's power has done in all of us. Amen? And so as part of the answer to this prayer in verses 1 through 10, he informs them and he informs us as we read some of the effects um, that have been accomplished in us. The, the thing is, we have to recognize what's already been accomplished in us through Christ's victory on the cross. I told somebody, it's just like me, you know how we, and we talked about it last week, we're looking for more God. I want more God, and I want more Jesus, and I want more God, I want more power. And, and what we don't understand is uh, when we say we want more, it's kind of an insult to God because what you're saying is uh, what he did, what he's given us was not enough. What we're saying is what Jesus gave us, that Jesus uh, did an incomplete job. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing me? So it's just like me looking for my keys and they're in my pocket. It's like me walking around the house mad looking for my eyeglasses and they're on top of my head. Mm -hmm. Are y'all hearing me? Yeah, yeah. So he prays for his readers to recognize what the power of God has already accomplished in us. Amen? And, and, and so uh, one of the things we have to understand, as he quickened us and made us alive, we were dead. The Bible says in Romans 3 and 23 that the wages of sin is death. We know that. How is that? Because man, all of us, were born in the sin, that means we were born dead. Amen? Mm -hmm. And so we do not become mankind. Man, you, me, us, we do not become spiritually dead because of the acts of sin. We don't become spiritually dead because we go and we fornicate. We don't become spiritually dead because we go and get high. We don't become spiritually dead because we lie, steal, cheat, kill. No, beloved, that's not what makes us spiritually dead. Man becomes spiritually dead because by nature we are sinful. Or if you've been born again, past tense, you have the nature of sin. So when we are walking in an unregenerate nature, meaning when we are walking as unforgiven sinners, mm -hmm. we are marking time to death. Mm -hmm. huh, two, three, four. Huh, two, three, four. Are y'all hearing me? Mm -hmm. Every day that we live, we become a little more hopeless. Because every day that we live outside of Jesus Christ is one more day closer to death. Amen? Amen. So when the Bible talks about trespasses and sin bring physical and spiritual death, it's the truth. And man's principal problem is that he has no right relationship with God. And because, why is that? Because man is initially alienated from God by sin. Remember when Adam and Eve were, uh, uh, what do you call it when you, they were evicted from the Garden of Eden. They were actually evicted from the presence of God because of sin. 
And the Lord put two cherubim at the entrance with flaming swords, meaning they could not come back in. Where all of mankind now, after the similitude of Adam, have been alienated from God. So we have to be brought back into fellowship with God. Amen? Amen. It does not have nothing to do prior to salvation with the way you live or how good that you've been. Amen? You can be good, you can go feed the homeless, right? But you're still dead even while you're alive. Amen? Amen? You are spiritually dead while being physically alive. Because man is dead to God. He is dead to spiritual life. He is dead to truth. He's dead to righteousness. He's dead to inner peace. He's dead to true, notice I said true, happiness and ultimately every other good thing in life. So Jesus, he took the punishment of death that belonged to us. He took it on his body on the cross and marked the bill that we supposed to have paid, he marked it paid in full. Mm -hmm. For everybody who would turn from their sin and accept him as Savior. That's what repent means. Repent does not mean, ooh, I'm sorry. Repent means do a 180. Not a 360. A 360 means you go back the way you started. Mm -hmm. A 180 means you turn from this podium and you go another way. Amen? Amen. So, the Bible says, see, Jesus took the punishment of death on his body on the cross, right? Romans 8 2 says this, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. John 5 and 21 says, for as the Father raises up the dead, and here's that word again, quickens them. Even so, the Son quickens whom he will. He makes alive whom he will. Amen? Mm -hmm. So, apart from God, mankind is spiritual zombies. Like them folk on the walking dead. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Except, in real time, spiritual zombies are dead. They just don't know they're dead. Mm -hmm. Amen? They go through the motions of life, but they don't possess life. When Paul says here, you are dead in the trespasses and sins, what he's given the readers is a reminder of the total sinfulness and depravity and lostness from which we, those of us who are believers, have been redeemed from. And oftentimes, we need a reminder of this from the scriptures. Why? Because believe it or not, we go through so many things that the scriptures, reading, studying, hearing, Bible study tonight is a form of spiritual warfare. Did y'all know that? Standing around, looking in the sky, going, Ooh, I, ooh, I bind and I loose and I... That ain't necessarily spiritual warfare. What we're doing tonight is spiritual warfare. You receiving truth is some of the great, not only receiving truth, but walking in the truth is some of the greatest aspects of spiritual warfare that you will ever receive. So, dead in the trespass, dead in trespasses and sins. When it, the word in indicates the realm or the sphere in which un uh, unregenerated of those uh, sinners who have not been reborn exist. See, folk are not dead, like I said, because of the simple acts mm -hmm. that have been committed, but because of their sinful nature. See, committing sinful acts don't make us sinners. Are y'all hearing me? Mm -hmm. We commit sinful acts acts because we are sinners. Let me say it again. Mm -hmm. Sinful acts doesn't make us sinners, but we commit sinful acts because 
we are sinners. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? And Jesus, you, you, need, you need proof? Jesus confirmed this when he said in Matthew 12 and 35, he said, the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. Let me say it again. The evil man out of his evil treasure brings forth what is evil. Amen? Are y'all getting this? Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. Amen. So, watch this. A sinner that does good, it's good, right? Mm -hmm. When people do good things and good acts, they're good. We're, we're not denying that. But doing good things cannot change your nature. Mm -hmm. Doing good things and giving good things and helping and doing good things cannot change a person's basic sphere of existence. Mm -hmm. And it can't reconcile you to God. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the spirit of life. Though I was dead, yet shall I live in him. Mm -hmm. See, before we were saved, we were just like every other person who were apart from God. We were dead in the trespasses of sins. And see, we were not dead because we had committed sin, but we were dead because we were in sin. So in this context, trespasses and sins, once again, do not just refer to the acts, but first of all, to the sphere of existence, to the person who is apart from God. Amen? Amen. Now look at verse 2. Wherein, in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience in time past. Remember, he's writing to the believers in the church at Ephesus in time past, prior to salvation. In time past, believers who were not yet believers were in a state of spiritual death. The only walking or living a person can do is according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that now working in the sons of disobedience. And we're going to explain that. You walked, the word, the phrase you walked means that you lived. At one time, this is how you used to live. Mm -hmm. The course of this world. The world, the word, course, course, it signifies all of the tendencies. It signifies how we used to think. It signifies what we used to pursue, our pursuits, our deeds, and so on that characterize the present period of history. When Paul says, and you see in the New Testament, and he always uses, and you hear the phrase, uh, do not be conformed to the world. Do not be conformed to this world world, right? Uh, he said in, in, in verse 2, uh, we walk according to the course of this world. What does he mean by the word world? The word world in the Greek in the original text is the word cosmos. Cosmos. It means world system. And what is world? What is the world system? That th those are the philosophies, the values, and the lifestyles that are opposed to God, and they are hostile to God. You know, you know the the philosophies and the values of life, and the lifestyles that's going on now that go against God's word. And the only way that you're going to understand what uh, uh, the world system is, you have to have a biblical worldview to understand the mind of God. 
And once you have a biblical worldview, once you get in the word and study the word, then you'll begin to understand how God views his values, how he views things. Amen? Cosmos, the world system. Everything that's opposed to him. Well, how do we know that God opposes certain things? It's in his word. Mm -hmm. When you don't have a consistent diet of the word of God, maybe you're not interested in God because he is revealed through his word. Mm -hmm. Amen? And as Paul the Apostle makes clear, the course of this world follows the leadership and the design of Satan, the prince of the power of the air. Men that are sinful have many different ideas. They have many different standards that they live by. But watch this. Even though they have different standards and different ideas, they are in agreement, total agreement in the network of things in this world. And they believe those things are more important than the divine perspective of God. And all of them are of one mind because they have a common leader and a common Lord, the prince of the power of the air. Now we understand for a limited time, Satan is now the ruler of this world. God still the world, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. That's still an absolute truth. But Satan has a lease on the earth. That's why he's called in the New Testament the ruler of this world until the Lord cast him out. And John 12 and 31 talks about that. And until the Lord cast him out, he'll continue to rule. So the power of the authority of the air refers to when he's talking about air it refers to the earth's atmosphere or the location of the invisible realm where Satan and his demons move and exist and so when we talk about the world system the world system is characterized by three elements humanism materialism and sexual perversion let's say it again humanism materialism and sexual perversion. Now, now, now let, let's deal with humanism. What does humanism do? Humanism places man above everything else. What does materialism do? It places a high value over physical things, especially money. And sexual perversion, it dominates our society. Sexual perversion dominates our society, Western, uh, modern Western society more so than any other society since the lowest periods of ancient Greece and Rome. That's a heavy statement. Ancient Greece and Rome where rape, prostitution, homosexuality, and sodomy was accepted. Brutal rape. Um, I was reading some commentary a couple of weeks ago where in that society they had a low view of children as well. So how we have children now with special needs, if children were born in the, the Greco-Roman era and the children maybe had a handicap or born crippled or they believed in killing them. Mm. Yeah, it, 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 that thing was disturbing to me. But that's how, that's why um, me and a friend was talking and, and, and uh, maybe a couple of days ago, just looking at the condition of the world. But there's nothing new under the sun. We're just getting a glimpse of certain things now because man is so bold and shaking his fist in the face of God that they burn the closet down. No, nobody's hiding their proclivities. They're, there's no more hiding in the closet. 
Th this is me. I'm me. Mm -hmm. You know, here with it. I'm placing myself. I'm living my truth. No matter how degrading that you think it is, it's my truth. If I want to be a cat, I'm going to be a cat. That's my truth. Mm -hmm. Amen? Now, let me give you some alarming statistics on a little bit of sexual perversion in the United States. 200,000 people. This, these are 2023 stats. 200,000 people in the United States identify as porn addicts. 40 million U.S. adults visit pornographic websites. Men are 543% more likely than women not only to watch porn, but to be addicted to porn. 40 million U.S. adults visit internet porn sites regularly. Now, this one, I'm, I, I don't believe it. Average exposure to porn is 13 years old. I think it's about nine. Because these kids now, you're giving your babies iPads and iPhones, and they can go on YouTube and TikTok at two and three years old. So I, I believe the average exposure to porn now is about five or six. 50% of marriages are jeopardized by porn. 68% of young adult males use porn once a week, our young men. 60, now here, now this, is, this is the doozy right here. 64% of Christian men and 15% of Christian women say they view porn at least once a month. Things that make you go, hmm. Back to Ephesians. <laughs> so prior to the Ephesians being converted, they used to conduct themselves with such ungodly practices, mm -hmm. ungodly values. The prince of the power of the air could be read as the ruler of the kingdom in the air. And so they also used to live by the dictates and the wishes of Satan. You know how, me and Corey was talking about this earlier, you know, you say, you, I'm my own man. No, you ain't. All of us, God created us to be governed. So you're either governed by God or you're governed by Satan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Paul refers to these ideologies that are like fortresses in which people are imprisoned. They need to be set free and brought captive to Jesus Christ and the obedience to the truth. See, before we came to Christ, we're living in sin. We know that. We know that. That's basic. Mm -hmm. So the life without Jesus is a life that aims to please the flesh of man. Mm -hmm. Satan appeals to the flesh of man. We know the scripture, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All means all. Mm -hmm. We are first of the flesh. We live for pleasing our own selves before we came to Jesus. So the Ephesians in Ephesus, the believers in Ephesus was no different. Now, not all unsaved people are necessarily indwelt at all the time by, day, by Satan or possessed by devils. No. But watch this, knowingly or unknowingly, they are subject to Satan's influence. Amen? Amen. Why? Why? Why is this? Because prior to being or going or receiving the new birth experience, we share Satan's nature of sinfulness and we exist in the same 
sphere of rebellion against God. Right? So we respond naturally to the leading of Satan and to the influence of his devils. The ungodly and devils and the enemy are on the same wavelength. When he talk about the world, the cosmos, and the air, they will almost be synonymous. Both of them represent Satan's realm or his sphere of influence. Amen? Now watch this. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says, and for bear for me, you love not the world, nor the things of the world. Amen? Mm -hmm. If any man love the cosmos, the world system, then the love of the Father is not in him. But all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, the cosmos. And the world passes away but, and the lust thereof. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Amen? Now look at verse 3 of Ephesians. Chapter 2. Among also we, us, the ones who say now, all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, we fulfilled whatever the flesh wanted, we went and got it. You know you did. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as others. So Paul's primary purpose here is not to show, see, what are you doing? Listen to me. He ain't showing how unsaved people now live. So the teaching here is valuable for that purpose. But listen what he's doing. I know y'all saying this ain't deep. I, I don't care about that. This is to remind believers how the, the readers, the original audience, and we ourselves used to walk and used to live. All of us at one time live in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of our flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, just like everybody else. So when he says, we all had our conversation, meaning that's how we conducted ourselves. That's how we carried ourselves. Right? Children of wrath refers to people who are subject to divine punishment. Born again believers are not children of wrath. We are not waiting on the wrath of God, but children of, 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 of disobedience. Children of disobedience. Those that defy God. Those that hear the gospel and will not respond are children of wrath. Our body of flesh came from the earth. And causes us to want to be of the earth. Amen? So we have to crucify our flesh and put the spirit of God in control of our life. The carnal or the fleshly mind is an enemy to God. And so the battle that's been going on, it's been raging. And I mean, it's been, it's been like pounding. Uh, since Adam and Eve is the battle for the soul of man. It ain't about the devil don't want your house. What are you gonna do with a house? Devil out of my car. What are you gonna do with your car? No, it's after your soul. It's for the soul of man. The flesh wanna control the soul. What is your soul? Your thoughts, your mind, your will, and your emotions. That's why I said earlier today, you. A man or a woman of God cannot be led or governed by their emotions. They have to be led and governed by the Spirit of God. Amen? The Spirit of God comes to dwell in us. If you become a spiritual person, if you become a spiritual being, meaning born again. 
So the breath of life is the spirit of mankind. The breath of life within us is of God. He breathed the breath of life into us like he did Adam when we became a living soul. Amen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the soul is like the will of man. God won't force nobody to follow him. We have a choice to choose who we're going to follow. Mm -hmm. Our soul, the soul of man is a decision maker. The flesh, our flesh, the flesh of man is connected with the earth. Mm -hmm. And our flesh will always desire to sing. I don't care how many tones you got, how long you dance, I don't care how, how high you jump and twirl in the air. I don't care how much you sing, preach, prophesy, evangelize, your flesh gonna fight you. Because it desires to sin. So the battle comes between the flesh and the spirit over the soul. That's the war. <laughs> Now, what's going to rule in your life? The flesh or the spirit? Flesh of man brings death and hell. The spirit man brings life and life more abundantly. So is there really any choice? Oh, Lord. Every believer that's a believer now was once totally lost in the system of the world. The flesh and the devil. That's why our war is, it, 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 our enemies that, that we war against is the flesh. It ain't just the devil, it's the flesh. Our thoughts, hmm. which are strongholds, and the devil. Amen? Mm -hmm. Who are the prince of demons, who are the power of the air. So those are fallen man's Three great arenas where he in a losing battle, amen, with spiritual enemies. Yeah. There are enemies who, by nature, he's not allied. First John 2 and 16 tells us this. For everything in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life mm -hmm. is not from the Father but from the world. So rather than all men being children of God, you know, everybody says, well, you know, everybody's a child of God. I'm sorry. Everybody is not a child of God. You have to be made a child of God. You have to be born into the family of God. That's why you must be born again. All men are not children of God. All men are God's creation, and he loves everybody. But everybody's not his child. Most of the world likes to think so. But those who have not received salvation through Jesus Christ are by nature, according to John 3 and 18, children of wrath. Mm -hmm. Not Jesus said to the Pharisees, you can't understand what I'm saying because you like your daddy. Well, our father's Abraham. No. Before Abraham was, I am. He said, that you're like your father, the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. He's a liar even now. Jesus said, we ain't got the same father. Your father is the devil. Amen? So apart from reconciliation through Christ, every person by nature through human birth is the object of God's wrath. Everybody. His eternal judgment and condemnation. Once you're born into the world. Yeah. And so they are characterized most accurately not only as sons of disobedience, but consequently as children of wrath, objects of God's condemning judgment. Who wants to be on that side? 
In verses 4 through 6, the word but, thank God, begins to disclose God's response to man's sin. This divine response is expressed in three main verbs. Number one, God, what did he do? But he quickened us. Because they were morally dead in sins, the Lord gave them spiritual life. Number two, it says, and have raised us up together. That is, God has not allowed these believers to remain in the grave of their own life with the simple ways, his simple habits. He brought, he brought them into the newness of life and the demonstration of the newness of life. Amen? And number three, he made us sit together in heavenly places. That is, he has brought us into his presence and into an intimate relationship with himself. Amen? That's mm, good. <laughs> Look at verse four. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. But God. Salvation is from sin and by love. So the two words, but God, show where the initiative was in providing the power of salvation. God's great desire, his greatest longing is to be rejoined with creation that he made in his own images, his own image, his images. He created in his own image and his own likeness. So his greatest desire is to be rejoined with those he, he created. We are his crowning achievement. Amen? Mm -hmm. The rebellion and the rejection is on man's side, not God's. Salvation for God's glory is by the motivation and power of God's great love. Why is he doing it? He's motivated by love, man. He, he's intrinsically kind. He's intrinsically merciful, man. He's intrinsically loving toward his creation. And in his love, he reaches out to nasty, vile, sinful, rebellious, depraved, destitute, and condemn human beings. And he offers them salvation and all the eternal blessing, the unsearchable riches. He offers it to them and lavishes it them on them to those who receive what he has to offer. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? So, mankind's rebellion it's not only against God's lordship, it's not only against his law, but it's against his love. This is good stuff. It's good stuff. Even though God ha has been greatly offended, who's been more offended? We can talk about offense and walking around with the carrying the spirit of offense over what somebody said or what they did how they treated us, mm -hmm. but who's been more offended and sinned against than God? Mm -hmm. We get a picture of it, a glimpse of it, in Matthew 18 and 23 in the parable of the unforgiving servant. Mm -hmm. But because of God's, his rich mercy and his great love, he offered forgiveness and reconciliation to us as he does to every repentant sinner. Amen? Amen? Even though in their sin and in their rebellion, all men, all men, all men participated in the wickedness. You participated in it. I participated in it. I know you're saying in what? In his crucifixion. We all participated in his crucifixion. How do we do that? Because he died for our sins. Mm -hmm. God's mercy 
and his love provide a way for man to participate in the righteousness of his crucifixion. God said, I know, I know what y'all. I, I know what you've done. Even though we haven't done it yet. <laughs> He's all knowing. So he knew when we were going to be born. He knew that after Adam sinned, we were going to be born into sin and shaped in iniquity. Mm -hmm. But God says, because of my great love for you, your penalty has already been paid. Mm. Man, I know that it is. That that don't excite nobody no more. I, I know, I know. As my cousin Nina say, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, that 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 kind of stuff ain't exciting. How God, what God done for us. If it ain't a car or a spouse or a house, we ain't excited about the suffering servant hmm. who reigns as king. God was saying through the scriptures, his his laws judgment has been satisfied through the work of his son on our behalf. God was saying through the scriptures for his sake, I offer you forgiveness. To come to me, you only need to come to him. No sound. Can you hear it now? Mm -hmm. World. John 15 and 13, great love has no one than this, a man that laid out his life mm -hmm. for his friend. Mm -hmm. Compassionate love for all of those who don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. It makes salvation possible. Mercy equals love. Salvation is for God's glory by putting on display his boundless mercy and love for all of those who are spiritually dead because of their sinfulness. And do you understand why did he love us? Why? We didn't deserve to be loved. Uh -uh. Because his mercy endures forever. Mercy, his mercy is equated to his love. And this love is not the love that we commonly know. It's love that he loved us with is the, from the Greek word agape, that is unconditional love. So his love is above conditions. His love is above human love. He loved us in spite of all the wrong in our life. And the following familiar verse is the greatest proclamation of love that I know of. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. While we yet in sin, God loved us enough to save us. Babies, we were headed for total destruction and God stepped in and blocked the way and turned us to life everlasting in his precious son, Jesus. Yeah. What this was that Jesus did for all of Christendom is love and action. Love is an action word. Verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, he had quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you are saved. Above everything else, a dead person needs to be made alive. Mm -hmm. 
And this is what salvation gives. It gives spiritual life. So they encourage born again believers who doubt the power of Christ in their lives like many do today. Paul is reminding them here. Yes. That if God was powerful and loving enough to give them spiritual life together with Christ, he's sure able to sustain that life. Somebody type, he is a keeper. <laughs> yeah, he's a keeper. The power that raised us up out of sin and death made us alive together with Christ. That's the same power, that very same power continues to energize every part of our Christian living. Amen? Amen. The scripture said we were dead in sins, made alive. Mm. Quicken means to make alive. More, far more than anything else, a spiritually dead person needs to be made alive by God. They can't make themselves alive. Salvation brings spiritual life to the dead. Mm -hmm. The same power that raises believers out of death and makes them alive is the same power that energizes every aspect of our Christian living. Oh, why I can't I struggle? We got the same power. Well, I just I don't know because I I and then, the same power. Well, I am the, the devil. The same power. Oh, no, no, I tell me, I tell me, I tell me. The same power. In Adam, everybody died. In Jesus Christ, everybody lives. Jesus is the quickening spirit which brings life everlasting. He is the resurrection and the life. Because he lives, we live also. So he took his sin on our, he took our sin on his body on the cross. Our sin died on the cross. Y'all know that. Mm -hmm. In the place of our sin, Christ clothed us in his righteousness. We don't have any. He clothed us in his righteousness, washed us in his blood, we, was, we are saved in Jesus Christ, not because we deserve it, but because he loved us. And Jesus offers this to everybody. It's up to us to accept this free gift from Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 and 45, and so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. When we become believers, born again of the water and the spirit, we are no longer alienated from the life of God. Amen? We become spiritually alive through the union with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and thereby for the first time became sensitive to God. Paul calls it walking in the newness of life. For the first time, uh, we can begin to understand spiritual truth and desire spiritual things. Where before we didn't, we couldn't understand spiritual truth and we did not desire spiritual things. Because we now have God's nature. We can now look for godly things. We can now seek those things which are all above. Right? Rather than the things that are on the earth. And that is what results from being alive together with Christ. We shall also live with him, Paul says in Romans chapter 6, says the apostle, and our new life is indistinguishable from his life lived in us. In Christ, we can't help but be pleasing to God. I want to learn how to please God more. <laughs> Allow him to live through you. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to stop right here. Um, we'll start at verse 6 next week. We did